So here are some characteristics that I think uh, I would hope that we would look for in leaders and that I would also hope we would practice ourselves uh, from the presidency. The first thing I think that's a mark of a great president is humility. Not in the sense of Franciscan humility, though that would be great, but the ability, and you all would particularly appreciate this, the ability to react to changing circumstances, to changing data, not to alternative data, but to data, in order to learn from your mistakes. Many of us would not be in this room if John Kennedy had not had the ability to learn from his mistakes. He becomes president in January 1961. He inherits a, uh, the planning for an invasion of the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. He authorizes it in April in a very hasty way. It's a disaster. He says that if that we lived in a parliamentary system, he would resign. And he, at that point, did something that was really, arguably, for a politician, the hardest possible thing to do, which was that he decided to show weakness in front of the last person on the planet before whom he wished to show weakness. John Kennedy was 44 years old, a Democrat, and a lieutenant junior grade in the United States Navy. Dwight Eisenhower was 70 years old, a Republican, and a five-star general, the conqueror of Hitler. Kennedy had run for office and had very much created the impression that Eisenhower was yesterday's news. Uh, during the campaign, I, uh, Kennedy referred to Eisenhower as that old asshole, and uh, Eisenhower referred to Kennedy as the young whippersnapper. So depending on your point of view, I know you think that MSNBC and Fox just started all this, but it's been going on for a long time. But Kennedy had the internal fortitude, if you will, to swallow his pride and to admit he'd made a mistake. He asked Eisenhower to come see him at Camp David. They met at Aspen, the presidential cabin. They sat down and Kennedy simply said, I don't know what went wrong, I need help. And Eisenhower said, well, Mr. President, did you have a meeting before the operation where everyone involved had their own, uh, had a full airing of the pros and cons so you could weigh the merits and play people off each other. And Kennedy said, well, there was a meeting, but they were separate and there was never a full hearing. And Eisenhower said, that was your mistake. Cut to October 1962. Kennedy's sitting in bed uh, having breakfast. He's brought photographic evidence that the Soviet Union is deploying offensive nuclear weapons to Cuba. 90 miles from Florida, uh, casualty estimates range from 70 to 100 million Americans if there had been a hemispheric exchange of nuclear weapons in the fall of 1962. My own view is if there had been a hemispheric exchange, it would have become intercontinental. It would have been hard to have stopped it at that point. It was uh, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. later called that the most dangerous hour in human history. We were that close to Armageddon. What got us out of it was the tempered Kennedy the Kennedy who had asked for advice and had the guts not only to ask for it, but then the fortitude to follow it. He then convened the world's longest committee meeting. I know that many of you think you've been part of those meetings, but uh, it was the executive committee of the National Security Council, XCOM. It lasted for 13 days. He had the top level cabinet, the Joint Chiefs, the CIA, he had everyone in the same room hearing the information at the same time so that they could resolve this as one. If there had been an exchange, a nuclear exchange in the fall of 1962, it's hard to imagine that the structure of life as we know it would be the same. And I think we owe that in a large measure to John Kennedy's ability to learn from his mistakes. The second thing is a level of candor. And I don't just mean being honest, although again, that's a great human virtue, I suppose. I'm a Southerner, so we, you know, we just lie about everything. Um, but we do it very politely. Uh, that's our main goal. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of the South, a little school called Sewanee um, in the middle of Tennessee. It's a little Episcopal school. For those of you, there may be one or two of you who don't know it, it's best understood as a combination of Downton Abbey and Deliverance. So that sort of gives you, gives you some sense of it. Um, but a level of candor about the stakes and costs of great national and international enterprises. Presidents who've gotten in trouble in American life, by and large, are those who have not been forthright with the people about the cost of war, 
the course of a war, or the cost of a great enterprise. Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, uh, among, among many others. And I think the best definition of this comes from, not from an American, from a half American named Winston Churchill. Uh, Churchill in 1942 uh, was challenged with a vote of confidence in the House of Commons. Hard to believe, given the image we have of Churchill as the great figure of defiance, the Churchill of 1940. The Churchill of 1942 was in trouble. Uh, we had no capital ships in the Pacific. Uh, Pearl Harbor obviously had happened. Singapore had fallen. Hitler was on the, on the move in North Africa. The Middle East was in danger. It was a dark moment for the alliance. Franklin Roosevelt took to his bed for about three weeks in the, this winter of 42. In London, Churchill faces this challenge from Parliament. And he writes a 10,000 word defense dictates it himself, smoking and drinking, the way we should all create. Uh, uh, you know, Churchill never had a moment where there was not alcohol in his bloodstream, which brings me to the great Lincoln line about Grant, if, it, if, if that's what it takes, send a crate of that whiskey to all my generals. You know, that's, that's not a bad way to go. And I've gotta tell you one other story that has no relevance whatever, but it's a good story. Um, Churchill was once one day in the men's room of the House of Commons. Uh, at one of those long trough urinals and was standing there and Clement Attlee, the great laborite socialist uh, leader comes in and stands next to him and Churchill moves over. And Attlee looks at him and says, feeling standoffish today, Winston? And Churchill said, no, Clement, it's just that every time you see something big, you want to nationalize it. So, <laughs> yeah, sure. okay. really no relevance whatever, but I promise you, that's what you're going to remember. Um, which brings me to a second quick story for Jim Baker, the great Secretary of State, who lost a race for Attorney General in Texas in 1978, the only race he ever ran and lost. Masterful, I mean, one of the great men of our time. And he was on his way out to lick his wounds uh, at his ranch the weekend after the election. He's filling up his truck with gas, and an old Texas boy walks up and says, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Jimmy Baker? Baker said, yeah, sometimes. Guy said, doesn't that just piss you off? <laughs> um, again, not a lot of relevance, but there we go. Um, back to Churchill in 1942. Uh, so he's in the House of Commons. He's uh, offering this defense, and he says this. The British people, and I would say the American people, can face any misfortune with fortitude and buoyancy as long as they are convinced that those who are in charge of their affairs are not deceiving them or are not themselves dwelling in a fool's paradise. It's the covenant of modern democracies. We, we will do what it takes, but you have to convince us that you are not lying or that you're not lying either to us or to yourself. That level of candor is absolutely essential moving forward. Roosevelt picked up the theme on Washington's birthday, 1942, delivered a fireside chat in which he quoted Thomas Paine saying that tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. And he said, the news is gonna get worse and worse before it gets better and better. And the American people deserve to have it straight from the shoulder. Give it to us straight and we'll do what it takes. But it absolutely requires that. The third is a level of curiosity, uh, a kind of intellectual curiosity. Thomas Jefferson could not have written the Declaration of Independence in the third week of June, 1776 if he had not been conversant with the great shifts and changes that were going on in the Western world prior to that moment in political history. He didn't simply sit down to write a committee report. He had been immersed in, as had the other founders, this broad conversation. What was going on? The European Enlightenment, the Scottish Moral Enlightenment, the Protestant Reformations, the translation of sacred scripture into the vernacular, the rise of the bourgeoisie, the scientific revolution, the entire shift of the world from being organized essentially vertically from kings and popes and prelates dictating the nature of reality either by accident of birth or incident of election to a more horizontal understanding that we are all born with a right to determine our own destinies and while that promise was not expanded to all without a great deal of bloodshed and pain through the years, the founders did set in motion the political manifestation of that shift from the divine right of kings and the authority of priests to 
a belief in the power of inquiry and the power of reason that was the gift of every individual person. It is the most fundamental shift, I'd argue, in two millennia since the Christianization of Europe. And Thomas Jefferson and those politicians were, knew it, they understood it, and they were putting it into political reality, and we live in many ways in the light of the fruit of their curiosity. The last, I think, is, is a sense that we require so often a level of partisan purity from our leaders. Too many of us do, anyway. The great problem of the age is reflexive partisanship as opposed to reflective partisanship. There's nothing wrong with being partisan. The point of America is to disagree peaceably. If the point were to agree, we would be an autocracy. But if I decide that anything you have to say, if you're on that side of the aisle and I'm on this one, that anything you say is wrong before you get up to say it, and if I'm already composing my tweet attacking you before you've had a chance to say anything, then I'm foreclosing the possibility of reason, the fruit of that sense of curiosity, to play a larger role in that eternal contest between reason and passion. And too many of us, we are as partisan as we have been since the 1850s, and that decade, I'm here to tell you, didn't turn out too well. 800,000 Americans died at the end of that decade. We can disagree. We should disagree. But if I don't listen to what you say, then I'm unilaterally disarming. And I'm putting tribalism ahead of the larger good and arguably of my own good. Because you may have something to say that's going to ameliorate my condition. It's going to make me more prosperous. It's going to make my kids' future better. We can be partisan. We always will be. It's in the nature of things. We all have our heroes and our creeds and our allegiances. But that doesn't mean that someone else with different heroes and different creeds and different allegiances does not have something to contribute and to offer. I want to leave you with this. Um, the middle of World War II, President Roosevelt was reading uh, The Talk of the Town in The New Yorker, and there was an essay by E.B. White defining democracy. And he ripped it out of the magazine and would read it out loud to people. And this is what he said. This is E.B. White defining democracy in the middle of the Second World War. Democracy is the line that forms on the right. It's the don't in don't shove. It's the hole in the stuffed shirt through which the sawdust slowly trickles. It's the dent in the high hat. Democracy is the recurrent suspicion that more than half the people are right more than half of the time. Democracy is the feeling of privacy in the voting booths, the feeling of communion in the libraries, the feeling of vitality everywhere. Democracy is a letter to the editor. It's a score, the score at the top of the ninth. It's an idea which hasn't been disproved yet, a song the words of which have not gone bad. It's the mustard on the hot dog and the cream in the rationed coffee. FDR would read that out loud and say, them's my sentiments exactly. I think they should be all our sentiments. Thank you very much. <laughs>